I always say that the best thing about consulting are the people that you work with. You're always working with the best, pushing each other to learn more, do more, be more, and go even further. Which is why I'm very excited to be able to go through these conversations with some of our alumni who've gone on to even greater success beyond their consulting career and learn from them about the high points, the low points, the achievements, the wins, and the lessons that we can all take and apply in our future journeys. Fadi Arbid, welcome to Unscripted. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you, and from our little chats that we had before, I'm, uh, I think it's going to be a super exciting uh, conversation. Hopefully. Uh, because there's been so much happening since uh, you were with us uh, some time ago. So before we delve deeper into it, can you uh, give me a, an idea of the journey that you've taken since you were with us and then beyond? So after business school and, and joining uh, the firm, I, uh, the first day I joined the firm, I realized one of my colleagues, also a previous alumni of ours, I told him, I think I'm going to do very well. I like it a lot here, but I don't think I'm going to be here too long and I want to do something else and, as an entrepreneur. And that was the first day, and which was a bit of a telling about what my personality was always, that always think, seeking something more, I was more adrenaline, let's say. And uh, even though it was a highly paid job, I was very young, I had student debt, I had student loans. So actually I needed the cash, but it was, it was a view that uh, didn't really matter. So I worked uh, with the firm for three years, and actually I said to two colleagues that eventually made senior partners in the firm and in other firms in consulting, uh, that I'll be leaving after three years and before the three-year mark. And actually I was the only one amongst them. We all pledged it to ourselves, but I was the only one that did it, I think. Just because, again, uh, true to that, doing something different. But then I didn't go specifically as an entrepreneur, even though I did create a company while I was at the firm. I went to Saudi Arabia, out of all odds, which is a country I didn't particularly fancy at the beginning, uh, because it was a, an era of a lot of security uncertainty specifically. But I decided to go there. I met uh, my now partner who hired me for a private equity firm called Amwal Khalij. It was one of the pioneering first firm to come and build the firm together. He was my first boss, mentor, became a close friend, family almost. And basically worked and built Amwal Khalij, a private equity firm. Uh, the pledge was I'll stay there for one year in Riyadh. That was actually my condition. And ultimately going to build the Dubai office, uh, which, uh, you know, he said, yes, we shook hand on that. I stayed 15 years in Riyadh, so actually, not that he didn't deliver, actually I didn't want to leave, to be fair. But we did have a Dubai office, we did have a Cairo office, we built a firm with about $700 million of assets uh, in Amwal Khalij. And then across my life in Riyadh, I also ventured into a lot of entrepreneurial stuff, from a literally a shawarma chicken place to a, a big medical center with plastic surgery, that I'm still actually an uh, executive committee member and main shareholder of. And in 2014, I decided to uh, venture out of private equity, but keep, I loved investing, but do it on the public space uh, in the MENA markets. So uh, with an ex also, uh, the, one of the firm ex, I would say intern, we started like, uh, you know, thinking about the idea of doing something on the hedge fund side and alternative investing. Uh, he was an intern at Boos, uh, at, the, at the firm back then. We started like putting a business plan together and uh, to do a MENA alternative asset manager. When it was about time to do it, he actually was in a corporate world, had a lot of, I think, he had a promising future ahead of him and he delivered very well on it. So I think his risk reward profile was different than mine. He was also in another golfing country. So, and I decided to go and do it. I told my, my Ammar, my partner, uh, my boss then, uh, that I want to do this and I want to do it alone. And he said, let's do it together again. So we started what we called Amwal Capital Partners. We kept the name Amwal, people still confuse it because I think I was probably not creative enough to, to think about another name and I didn't have all this uh, creative setup in my mind, but I just said, let's keep Amwal, it's our legacy. And, and we created a uh, Amwal Capital Partner, which was an alternative investment manager with three different things, which is one owned by the team, I think myself and my partner, uh, two, uh, you know, that, uh, which intend to invest in public, not in private, and three, uh, which intends also to have a lot of, I would say, international investors as opposed to just MENA and local and GCC investors. Uh, and that was like, you know, I would say uh, pseudo-entrepreneurial, I would call it, because it's very conventional, it's not tech. Today we associate entrepreneurship with VC, with tech, with innovative stuff, which wasn't the case for me. So I created something boring, I would call it, like uh, greedy and boring uh, in the alternative space. And I, uh, so we created Amwal Capital Partner, myself, another colleague of Amwal Khalij. And we basically created Amwal Capital Partners in 2014. Initially it was uh, 
the benefit and the perks of living in Riyadh for 10 years, gaining the trust in the hearts of a lot of my very, very good Saudi friends till now. And basically, uh, you know, putting 60, 70 million dollars. Now, we're in, a, in a few months, we're going to celebrate a decade, decade of the firm. We run about 1.7 billion dollars. 80% of our money is institutional. The firm is owned by its team. We sold equity to what was a trainee and intern back then. He is also now an, an, an owner. We're going to have also other owners. That's the idea. Uh, also, along that venture, I did uh, I did a lot of uh, like VC investing myself as an angel, but also I created a startup in the U.S. that's today up and running called Hoken, uh, that I'm not an executive of, but quite heavily involved at least on the fundraising and strategy of. Uh, and that's it. Along the way, I got married, three kids, uh, do a lot of sports, and, and that's it. So that's where we are. I like that you say that's it at the end of a very long list of achievements and multiple companies. So I think you're doing yourself a disservice. It's actually quite a lot. And look, it's very, when I listen to your story, it's very clear that you are quite purposeful about where you want to go with your life and what it is that you want to do. And, you know, sometimes people say, okay, I look back and I connect the dots. Maybe there's a little bit of that in it, but at the same time, the way you tell the story, it seems that, you no, know, it's not connecting the dots looking back. You actually had, had a path that you planned. So if you, if you do look back now, knowing all the plans that you had in your mind, and I know some of the things you started didn't work out, but then you moved on to other things, is where you ended up now, as you saw it 15 years ago or 20 years ago? Or is it, how, how far off the vision that you had for yourself is it? It's a great question. I, I, I sometimes self-reflect. Did I uh, under-promise myself, over-achieve, or did I over-promise myself and under-achieve vis-a-vis what I had in mind? It's a very hindsight question, but I always knew I wanted to be independent. And when I say independent, in terms of like not working for someone else, working for my own, ultimately. And not specifically financially independent, but also that's a result of it. Also I wanted to become financially independent. Monetary gains was not my primary purpose ever in life, but was I think it's always been, I always say that it's always a byproduct of your success, if you're successful in whatever field. People tell me I want to go to investment banking or consulting because there's a lot of money. I said, this is a strong purpose. This is, uh, you need to do something and you do it well. If you do well, you, you'll succeed. And then if you succeed, you'll make money. I also wanted to have the flexibility to do other stuff. That's why when I joined the firm back then, I thought that that's too daunting of a job to just to basically uh, be completely focused on, you know, on your clients all the time. I want to also, I'm a bit of a uh, wild cat in that aspect. So I wanted to do other stuff. I wanted to control my time, whether it's my free time for sports, whether also do an adventure here and there. I, the accountability of my time was very important. Like, I'm happy to work hard in everything I do, but I wanted just to know why I'm doing it, because I'm doing it for myself. So, and I've never been scared of losing money, uh, even when I didn't have a house. You know, your primary investment is typically your house. You save, once you have your house, you have your building blocked, and then you just go, start venturing into something a bit more funky, more exotic. For me, it was the opposite, actually. The house was came really later, like really later in the process. I didn't have a house. I put money in startups. My first hundred thousand dollars that I that I made it was uh, was put in a startup and my second hundred thousand was put in a startup that I lost fully but I didn't even lose one minute of sleep over, over like, I just learned so much through that process I learned how to pitch to investors I learned how to how uh, to put a business plan on the side how to hire people how to make mm -hmm. things function while I'm doing other things how to have other people working for you maybe hopefully giving them a better future while also yourself having that kind of passive income potential or passive upside I think the path has always been optimistic about life and positive about life and positive not risk taking yes no. was it always going to be finance no no fi finance was something i there was chicken sawar shawarma in there somewhere so yeah because it's always about you know you see opportunities left yeah. right and center we'll talk about the chicken sawarma shawarma but it's always been that curiosity so yes i would say uh risk taking very important optimism is extremely important and i think all of many lebanese are have to be optimistic i think i have no choice and i've always been optimistic so i've never I've never been scared about negative outcome. I've always been hopeful about positive outcome. And I think if you do, things will come. If you just do, just dive into it, things will come. Was Saudi, was Saudi, I mean, obviously you went to Saudi now is a very different place. It's thriving, it has very clear direction. There's a lot of people who are interested in investing in Saudi, but you went way ahead of the curve in 2006, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So was that also a specific part of the plan or how did not Where did the decision to go to Saudi Actually, when, when I first joined the firm, my first year was spent in Italy and in Holland. I was staffed on projects there. Even though I had relocated to the Middle East, I had put intermediate Italian on my CV. Uh, 
And uh, because of the Italian, it caught, I don't know, a partner's uh, attention in Italy. So they staffed me in Italy for nine months. And after living in Italy on, on a stipend, everything paid for, you don't want to come back and live in the Gulf. Even though the driver of my decision was to get closer to the region back again, I had been away for, de for a decade, my parents were there, etc. So there was a lot of emotional, and booze was a great compromise back in the days. So I was staffed after Italy and Holland. Uh, in Saudi, it was like, Oh my God, like it was so hard uh, for me. It was a shock. And I need, I, specifically in the context of Saudi back then, you know, security, as I was mentioning initially, mm -hmm. I was like really going there, just doing my work, staying in the hotel, going to the client, coming back. But I just realized along the way that I actually liked something about Saudi with the people. So actually my clients, I remember my, uh, one of my engagement manager back then, he was like, no, no, go, you speak, you, speak to him, you speak to him well. and Just go and tell him that, you know, I think he likes you. I was able to connect with, with, mm. with, the, with the Saudis, I think just by just being myself. So I like that about the Saudis, that I always, I didn't like the context, obviously coming from the West, Saudi in 2005, as you mentioned, 2006 was, no, was nowhere near what it is today. So when I got that opportunity in Saudi, it was more like, you know, setting up a private equity firm. It was not set up. I remember I went to my partner then, my boss at Amwal Khalij, he had literally an accountant at the firm we had a full logistics team and everything is like come take this office I'm like what am i leaving for i'm like you know what interesting i'll come here mm -hmm. spend the year let's see what's going to happen out of all odds people told me you're going to saudi like even my parents everyone like i they knew that when i was staffed on a saudi project i wasn't the most happy person ever but it happened actually i think the entrepreneur taste overtook mm -hmm. my comfort zone of being in saudi or in another country but then when i was in saudi then you know you have to look at the uh, the glass half full. Like, what's positive about it? You know, people, opportunity, virgin, uh, building bridges. A lot of the friends that I had back then were, you know, like you know, young guys. These guys got empowered now, and, and they became civil servant, high high level executive, uh, family business owners, etc. So that was, and I gave it a chance. I didn't live an expat life in Saudi. I didn't live at all the firm's life we used to live, working out of a hotel room. No, I lived in a compound. Even though a compound has 95 percent, if not. 99% expats. I actually spent just my sports in my compound, had still to now few friends, that really good friendship from the compound, expats like myself, but 90% of my friends were Saudi. I was like, you know, part of the Diwaniya, Istiraha, I was going, you know, Tuesdays, I had these families, and I built great bridges. So that was for me. And then after a year, when came the time to say, well, I have to go and run the Dubai office, I said, no, no, actually, I'm staying here. No one wanted to be in Saudi. That was an edge I would have over anyone and just building these bridges because no one wanted to go through the hardship, what they called hardship premium back in the days of being in Saudi Arabia. For me, I actually came naturally. You mentioned uh, you know, the friends that you made, the relationships that you built, and this is back then, today we're in a world that's even more virtual, more sort of reliant on electronic means of, of uh, connecting between people. But for somebody starting today, you would probably be giving them a similar advice that helped you achieve a lot of your objectives. Right? Listen, yeah, I mean, it's, it's something to be virtually over a Zoom thing now today or Teams call or something, but it's something else to go and, you know, break fast, eat, uh, you know, break Ramadan, going to the house of someone, introducing them to their family, seeing their inner household. Nothing beats that in terms of building a rapport. Mm -hmm. like, like, you know, I think in Saudi for me, getting into the house of the people means getting to their heart. So I think the physical interaction was extremely essential. A lot of people wanted to cover Saudi, come and work four days a week and leave. They never built bridges. They've been 25 years consultant or bankers or advisors, or they never built real deep relationship. For me, deeper relationship comes with a personal natural commitment. It has to be natural. It's not like artificial, you're not pushing yourself. I live there. I might as well make the most of what's positive about there. The people, mm -hmm. the environment, what, the, what it offers me. And it offers me genuine friendship. And it, they're very welcoming people. They're very you know, loving people. and. They'll trust you if you also equally trust them and open up. So even when before getting married, I was telling my wife that she's going to have to come and live in Saudi. It was like, you know, it's going to be very hard for me. And I'm like, don't have a, a prejudice or misconception on Saudi. Come and give it a chance. You'll actually be surprised on qualities that you see for people here that you don't have in your own country, even Lebanon or other countries. Till now, my, my kids developed great friendships. Mm -hmm. uh, myself, all our family has a lot of ties to Riyadh. One thing that is quite clear in your journey also is it's not only about being an entrepreneur, it's actually being an entrepreneur that's starting many things or involved in many things at the same time. True. So tell me a little bit about the things that didn't work out. 
Yeah, I mean, a lot of things. I think more, more things didn't work out than things that work out. But the ultimate goal is that to have one or two that make up for the whole rest. Mm -hmm. and that's, I think, it's like an in investing. You have a home run and you, have, you take bets. So there's two approaches. Either you, everything you want to make and you want to have more winners than losers, and that's like in a stock portfolio, that's what you typically try to achieve. Or you want to just get a home run or two and try many without spreading yourself too thin. So this is the hard thing because, you know, a jack of all trade of jack of none. Like, you don't want to be also doing a lot of things. So, but along that journey, there's, you should be able to just focus on one or two things. Professionally, I, sh I will get bored if I only do one. It doesn't have to be full-time always. It could be in a smart way, having other people work for it as well, or teaming up with other people. So I, obviously, I told you I did, we, did a, we thought that we were going to do a chicken, uh, a chicken sandwich chain in Saudi, which we created, we, we invested, we funded, we put you know, a few hundred thousand dollars in it. It didn't work because I didn't give it the attention, the people that I was working with, that didn't, uh, we didn't have the experience on location. It warranted much more dedication to be in retail in Saudi than now. On the other hand, I also we did the medical center that I thought initially was going to be an imaging and uh, dental center became today everything but not an imaging center, it became a plastic surgery center, physiotherapy, but, and then the opportunity just came along that way, and now it's one of the biggest uh, one-day surgery centers in Riyadh, the 5,000 square meter facility, has employs 150 people, so I gave them the same odds of success. Mm -hmm. There's also some randomness, there's also a timing, there's also sometimes you're blessed with the right people around you, that will just also make it happen, it's always about people. But how do you, so clearly you're always on the lookout for opportunities, and you're not afraid to get, you know, grab them when they appear. How do you put yourself, you know, if you're advising somebody who's uh, maybe looking back and uh, in, in the midst of uh, their career, how do you keep a, a mindset that makes you open for opportunities? First, it's a personality trait. It's a personality feature. It's not like uh, you can be, like some people like to do things and they're very like, you know, a surgeon that's passionate about what he does. is passionate about what he does. I'm never going to. But some people that want to be entrepreneurs, if they're passionate about a subject field and they want to just focus on it, that's perfect. I don't, I don't recommend mm -hmm. for someone to just spread out. This is a personality feature. And it has its drawbacks, obviously, like as I was telling you, you just sometimes you could be doing many things and you just uh, dilute your effort across too many ventures as opposed to focusing on one. For me, that path was, there was a financial path in terms of financial asset management that I loved doing. I loved investing. And for me, part of investing is investing in many, th many stuff. It doesn't have to be monodimensional. It's not a single dimension. So creating... Uh, starting something, but eventually letting that thing take its course. Not specifically myself guiding it. So is it the buzz? Is it for you the buzz of creation, creating something from an idea and seeing it become yes, real? Yes, you know, putting together the element, whether it's capital, whether it's the people around it, whether the idea, whether the concept, you know, incubating it all the way. You just educate a kid for him walking and eventually giving him and teaching him languages and eventually, and then eventually he's going to walk on his own and just do things. It's a bit part of that. There's things that I like to do myself, like, you know, I, my business card remains my business card, which is, you know, running my firm and, you know, being the CIO of Amal Capital, for example, to now, and I'm very passionate about what I do, but you don't have to be monodimensional. You don't have to just be that. And mm -hmm. you could also think about investing. You could think about other things along the way. You have to be, it's about intellectual curiosity. If you're intellectually curious, you're, you're curious about many stuff. Like, you know, I did a lot of sports that I thought I'm going to do in my life. Eventually I did something completely different. So. If you're open, you're open. So it's not always the financial success that drives it. It's interesting, it's intriguing. I think I can make it happen. It's also a self-challenge. I'm a very competitive person um, with myself and maybe sometimes with others. People perceive it as others, but I, I use the others to be competitive with myself. It's always been the case. So for me, it's, it's also a personality. Do you have it? It's, it? There's no right or wrong. It's like, are you, are yeah, you getting once bored? You have, but once you have it, is it the relationships that, that uh, make let you find new opportunities? Is it the fact that you're, you know, I noticed today when we were taking the tour in the, um, in the experience center, you asked a lot of questions. And that's clearly a mindset that you're, you know, you wake up in it. It's your natural mindset to be curious and to ask questions. Is that something that has led you to a lot of these opportunities? I think intellectual curiosity is a virtue of any entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. has to, you have to be very curious. It creates compassion, it creates everything. If you're very self-centered, looking only at yourself, you probably would lose a lot. And I think it applies to business as well. You have to be curious. Not, not everyone is curious by nature. It's, some people are more close-minded, some people are more introvert, extrovert. But more curiosity is just why, how, what can it lead to? Well, it triggered something for me mm -hmm. and eventually I want to do it. So there's a very little commonality between financial services, a medical plastic, a plastic surgery center and a chicken and chicken, yeah. and, chicken <laughs> and a startup and hotel or 
things happen around you. We're immersed, especially in the era of information and, and technology. You're always immersed, you're always like watching stuff. There's also sometimes, why not me? There's always like, well, I also have that idea why I didn't have the guts to do it. So are you need there, to... Are there ideas that you, looking back, you regret not following up on? No, because most of the time, anything I just thought I could, rightly or wrongly do, I tried to do. Mm -hmm. The outcome is never guaranteed. A lot of failures along the way. And where, does, where does this mindset come from? Where this, you know, you're obviously, even at a young age, you have an entrepreneurial drive, you're not afraid of failure, take a lot of risks. Where does this come from? It's, I, I actually ask myself, it's not like my dad was, or it's not my mom was. It's actually, it, I think it's a very, I'm going to go to you know, like deep, deep, uh, you know, like uh, childhood stuff as a, as a war kid, like many of us are in Lebanon. You know, I think the fact that you're very confined to a micro environment with your ethnicity, religious environment, like in Lebanon, I was born the year of the war almost, right? So, and I left Lebanon where the war ended. I should have done the opposite, right? Like when you think about it, when you're very confined, you actually are very curious. If your nature is oppressed by being just confined to your building, your area, Either you just become that way or you actually develop a, a counter reaction of we want to discover the world. So actually my mom and my dad pushed me to go at 17 years old alone and study. So I went to France and I went to England and France wasn't enough. Then I went to England for my master's. Then I worked for a French company in Germany. Then I went to the US. I always was seeking, you know, I wanted to have a, the opposite profile of a typical Lebanese kid born in a specific area, confined to a limited area because of war and so on. So I think that's also part of the journey, you know, having that uh, curiosity to meet people from different backgrounds and everything because you were too much confined mm -hmm. into a small environment. I think that's, but that doesn't create entrepreneurship, that creates yeah. a certain inter intellectual curiosity. But I've always pot potentially been an open person about, you know, doing stuff, always been very hopeful of life. I always, I think if you're hopeful, like when I was young, and it's not like era, an era like today, you know, information is available, everybody applied to INSEAD, Harvard, Wharton. I was in an era where there was no internet. Like for me, these schools were like for really the geniuses of the world. Mm -hmm. I believed that I could do. So one day I said, I want to apply to business school. Then I want to apply to all business school. I, I got into all quasi all the schools I applied to. And it was an era where I'd, I knew people that could advise me. I know this guy that went to Harvard, that went to Wharton. Actually, I did it alone. And like, that gave me also even more confidence. So I think confidence also gets built up as you try stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you succeed in one, even if you fail in five others, uh, I think if you succeed in one, it just gives you the gut and the courage to just try another one, another one, with the possibility and the outcome of, of a negative outcome. I was probably lucky to have tasted success in some of these things. Mm -hmm. but I, and I've never been extremely smart. I've always thought I've been a hard worker. I've always worked hard. That's, that's always been something. That's but you're something. starting, as you said, you're, you're starting investments were ones that you lost. The first hundred. Yeah, yeah. My first medical venture when I was in, you know, when I w first started my work in consulting, uh, failed miserably. Yet uh, you continued. Yes, because I thought that, you know, you learn something from that failure. You learn something and actually it opens your eyes on something else. I was in medical supplies, we we're selling to medical centers. The medical center make more money than the supply companies. Like, okay, then money is more in this, in this service, in the service providers, not really in the supply providers. You know, it was a friend of mine, it was a very good friend of mine. We went and we created this other company, that the medical center, while I was at Amwal Khalij. And, and Amwal Khalij was really a great experience. I met a lot of people, I invested in private equity. I started learning about really investing. You know, I did some investment banking before consulting, some consulting. So, you know, I thought, I loved investing, that's for sure. I loved like, you know, putting some money, compounding, working for it somehow, whether understanding how it operates or just really like riding a curve and eventually compounding. I thought that was a very smart way of making money for someone that would like to do other things in the same, in the same time, you know, like just things that compounds. So as you, found, you found your calling in that sense, yeah, so, in, so you went all in. For yes, it. I went all in for investing. Hala, the way you describe it now, no, yeah, I went to Saudi and I started a private equity. But that wasn't very common back then. Right? And then I'll give you an example. I had three offers in private. It was Abraj and it was an established player. There was another firm as well in Abu Dhabi and there was Amar who was starting Amwal Khalij, mm -hmm. my partner. I went for the least likely one. This mm -hmm. one offered me a job. I was a number, maybe it was a 100 people firm or 50 people firm. This one was like, when I met Amar, it's like, okay, what's, what am I going to do? What's my title? What title do you want? Like, <laughs> that, I like that. I, I'm like a cowboy in that sense. Like, I like, I like the, the chaotic environment that I can carve to make it a proper environment. Mm -hmm. I like to have a contribution. You know, if you're one out of 100 people, your contribution is one out of 100. If you're a superstar, it's maybe 10%, not 1%. But if you're one out of three, your actual contribution if 30%, 35%, I'd like, and if you're smarter or if you're just a hard worker, you could be 50% and you can impact the outcome. Mm -hmm. 
I like I like to be in this situation. That's why I always start. Then ever since that job in 2006 with Amwal Khalil, which was kind of, I would call it semi-employee because I wasn't an owner of the firm, I was hired. It led me to Amwal, like, okay, then I want to just be a full owner of my investment firm. And that's what happened. That's when we started Amwal Capital, which also defied my expectation. But I had a vision. I said, it's going to be a billion dollar firm, hopefully in a few years. And today we're close to a two billion dollar firm. So that's why being hopeful, knowing what you lack, hiring people smarter than you, Hire people as good as you, a hard worker, same, sharing the same value. I think hiring smarter of you is something that people underestimate a lot mm -hmm. because people are insecure about themselves. Because when you hire somebody smarter, they outshine you. If they out outshine you and they could be insecure about taking their place, but you should never, remember, you should never forget that you, take, you have a skill set and it's a puzzle, you know, it's a puzzle of skill set. I may have something that you don't have. It could be an intangible one, it could be an emotional intelligence, it could be very different things. So for me, I'm always hiring people that are really like, at least smarter than me, if not as smart as me, or providing a very different dimension, if not the IQ side, let's say. And I think that was important for the success uh, of, of putting things together to work. When you were talking about your initial uh, initial uh, sort of investments and your initial ideas that you put your first 100,000 in and so on, you were single, you were young, the world is your oyster. Since then you've gotten married, you have three kids. Has your appetite for risk changed at all? It's actually increased. It's Does increased. this worry your wife? It, it, no, it doesn't worry anyone. Actually, this I keep that very segregated. And let me tell you why it means because I feel that what I wanted to do for myself now to do for four people, so I have to do four times more risk, or five people. The typical reaction is to do four times less risk. Yes, four, because yeah. people think that way, I, and and I think that's. I always thought that when I, you know, when I get kids specifically, I'll have to I'll, my my risk appetite. I'll become much more risk averse. I'll, my risk appetite will drop tremendously, significantly. The way I never worried about myself, I never worried about my kids because I'm also hopeful that I can, as long as I'm here in good health and able to take care of them, I think I'll be able to provide. I've taken more risk. Obviously, I've developed a certain financial base that's probably make you more comfortable. Mm -hmm. So I was blessed that, you know, by the time I had my first kid, I had, I thought that, you know, already I'm there. It's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm actually good enough. If I get my kids an education, I would have given my kids much more than my parents have given. They give me an education for me. I need to give my kids an education. If you give them a bit more than education, you give them more than what your parents gave you. Mm -hmm. For me, that's the first purpose. I thought that I was there. So after that's easy to take risk. And okay, if I've given them each an education and a house and a bit of money, that's even more. Mm -hmm. That has always been my purpose. So I've, I've thought about it that way. Uh, you mentioned that with your employees, so you're hiring people that are smarter than you, but you also mentioned something about wanting them to have ownership. Why is that important to you? Why, why do you feel it's important that your employees are also co-owners? Selfless and selfish at the same time, and mm -hmm. I'll tell you how. So, selfless because I think it's, you know, tomorrow you, the outcome is you're going to make a million dollars alone, or you're going to make, as a company, ten million dollars, and you're going to still make a million, but make another nine millionaires. I like to share. I think prosperity has ought to be shared. It's a positive thing. You cannot keep it for yourself. That's why I call the selfless side. It's not really like selfless in that sense completely. And let me explain how. I would not be happy being in my corner having made my money. Why? Why is it important? Because I live of people. Like I, I, I enjoy interacting with people. I enjoy being, being with people that are as... I think it comes from the background of being, again, go to the war and everything. So you want people to be also happy. Like I, I, I enjoy giving opportunity to people, bringing them from... Lebanon or other countries giving them an opportunity and I provided that to many people and I and I think if they work hard they deserve also the same outcome that you that you have they might not have the same tra traits of character they might not be as entrepreneurial but they might be better than you in certain dimensions let them be rewarded let them be happy so for me it's nothing actually feels better than making money than making other people be uh, comfortable mm -hmm. and happy and so that's one the selfless side I believe that they'll make your pie bigger if you're an owner of a good business. Mm -hmm. If people are owners, they'll also act differently. They'll actually want to give in more. They'll stay with you. They will be working for their own, like you are working for your own. Like Amwal Khalid was a great shop. I, I gave it my best. But actually, I give it even more at Amwal Capital when it became my firm. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually believe in its outcome. And I, and I want that shop to be five years down the line. You know, and I say it's selfless. First, because they'll stay with you. Second, because when I want to just step down, five, ten years down the line, let's say, I would like, you know, I'd like to have passive income and I would like these people to be carrying the load and making everyone money while you maybe not working as is hard. This, is this your legacy? What, the, the, uh, if you, in, you know, in five to ten years time, if you've retired and the people that you have given ownership to are, are continuing, is this how you think of legacy or is it something else? 
Honestly, I care less. I don't care much about legacy uh, in the sense of like, uh, I'm not that egocentric saying this is, this is me, I created that and this was, th no. I think it's more about creating something that sustain time, that make other people also comfortable and happy and that's a conduit for other people's happiness. Mm -hmm. And obviously that has an impact and you're happy with that. But that's, for me, that's also a byproduct. It's not the purpose to have a legacy. Like I don't, okay. you know, like Warren Buffett says something even for your kids, like, leave your kids uh, enough to do anything, but not too much to do nothing, right? Like, you know, just uh, enough to do anything, just give them that hope, give them the ingredients, but you know, not like, I don't care about legacy, even for my kids, even for my, I, I care about them having values, education, enough to get started. Let's talk a little bit about uh, how you're bringing up the kids, because you mentioned, you know, some of your drive was innate, it was your character, and maybe a little bit from the background and, and the life you were living before you traveled. Now you have three children, a couple of them are old enough to have serious conversations uh, with you. Are you trying to instill these values that you have in them or are you more hands off? You know, how are you, how, how is this drive translating into Fadi the father? So I try to spend a bit of time with my kids, it's hard. I feel sometimes a bit selfish because of work and your sports and your other things, but I try. I think the first thing is to inspire your kids, like inspire your kids with your value system like how you speak with people, how you treat people around you, whether they work for you, whether they work with you, whether you're colleagues. So we're not talking about, about business yet or anything, just first values. Like I think that's something I took from my parents. My parents, my father always treated everyone the same, no matter what their social status was. That's critical for me and never distinguish between them. So respect is very important for me. And, and, and for me, I'm harsher with my kids when they disrespect people that are, you know, that have, uh, that are working hard uh, so that's very important. For me, it's critical, the value system. And the second one is work hard. Like I always told my kid, I wasn't smarter than anyone else. I just worked. And the reason I worked is because my dad used to punish me if I didn't get good grades and reward me if I got good, good grades. So there was the punishment, there was the carrot, and there was the stick. So Do you do that to your kids? Now? Yeah, I do it somehow. But even though I think, you know, the sheer fact that probably I'm more blessed and financially than, than, than when I was when I was young, young it's they get much more than I think they deserve. I, I feel they still always get much more than they deserve. But I'm not gonna punish them for that. Like I, but at the same time, I try to inspire them. And, and that goes with sport. And, and how do you see it works is when they emulate you in certain things. Like uh, I do some sports, my kids want to do them. I never ask them to do them. And they do them and they want to do them even better than you. And there's, okay, the, so maybe sports is a proxy for them, how they perceive you. Because they see that you're giving it hard and they want to do the same. And also at the same time, you know, like create, for me, academics is very important at this age. It's important that they just get the good grades. I'm happy to give them more support, tutors, etc. I didn't have that chance when I was young. And I tell them that. I said, listen, I didn't have the chance to have a math teacher, an Arabic teacher or whatever. And you're so lucky. And if you don't get better grade than I got without even, that means that you're doing a bad job. So I try to put a bit of guilt here and there. It doesn't work all the time, but at least that's what, that's what you try to do with the kids. So, yeah. And, and my kids sometimes don't know what I do. Like, oh, my, somebody, a friend might ask me, what do you do? And, oh, you work in finance. What is it exactly that you do? So they start, I think they're at the age where they're getting curious about what you do. Your eldest is? 11 years old. Okay. And haven't taken her into the office yet? They come to the office, but you don't understand. They see an office with desks and Bloomberg screens. <laughs> so they just look at it and then they see, and they see a ping pong table and a pool table. And that's, that's the, the most exciting thing. part. Of yeah, it. that's exciting. They take the pull. It's like, oh, that's cool. You have a cool office. But that's you tell them, like, mm -hmm. you know, you invest in companies. Explain. So they, now they start to get a grasp of what what is it that we do. So clearly, a conversation with you is not complete if we don't talk about sports. No. The most interesting bit you told me uh, in, in the chit chat we had was that at some point you had to switch from Thai boxing to something quote unquote more gentle because you were appearing on CNBC with scars on your, on your face kind and of. your investors were wondering what, what's going on. That's another one yesterday. So where does this intensity of, of, uh, on the sports side come from as well? Is it, is it from the same place where the entrepreneurship comes from? What is, it, what is that about? I tried to think, I, I never thought about it until recently. Like I was re like, why am I doing what am I doing in terms of sports? Because think about it, like when I was young, I used to do judo. I was in a club called Buddha in Lebanon and because of relocation. I stopped judo, then I went to France to stop playing rugby. Always like contact. Not, not that I like violent, but I like contact. I like, because I think it's competitive sports, contact sport had a challenge. I don't know if it's the alpha male in, 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 a, in a man. I don't want to say it in a very macho way, but it was always like the competitive side of things, mm -hmm. the competing with someone. 
But then because of my work in investment banking and management consulting, I started doing much more going to the gym because that was the only thing that could accommodate your lifestyle when you're in a hotel and you're traveling. And I exaggerated there, so I also pushed. And I was 15 kilos, 20 kilos heavier than I am now. And, but then when I moved to Riyadh, I wanted also to, I wanted something to just to, you know, dedicate my energy to. So I discovered boxing and Thai boxing. And then I, I don't like half-baked solutions. So I went to Thailand and I started going to camps and, and training in camps and taking two or three weeks off. But even that is not regular, you know. There's lots of people who do Thai boxing. I'm pretty sure the vast majority of them have never been to a camp in Thailand. That goes about that <laughs> excessive. I think it's, people tell me you're a bit too excessive sometimes. It's like when I do things, I try to do them all the way. Are you trying to prove something to yourself or to others? Well, why are you so intense it's, about it? I think first I get satisfied if I give it my best. I think first. I don't know if I prove something to the others. Maybe you do ultimately because I share with the others because I'm very happy with what I do and I don't, again, it goes back to I actually enjoy things. It's like you go on a trip. People that go on a trip alone. I, I actually started going on trips alone when I started doing Thai boxing. Mm -hmm. I never thought I could be a solo guy. I like to share memory with someone. I like to reminisce over memory when I go back. I remember when we did that. If a memory stays with you, it dies with you. I actually wanted to live with someone else as well. So I think that was important for me. But actually in Thai boxing, I realized that actually I'm doing it for me. Because I was going alone on camps up until you know I had friends, my brother, wife, etc. A lot of people came with me. To really see that I was really doing Thai boxing in Thailand because people like could be very suspicious about it in Thailand. Spending you know months or two months in a camp, doing six hours of training a day, you know, uh, you know, brutal sparring, and it's not something I was doing when I was young. I started when I was like in my late twenties and early thirties, and I realized no, actually I can travel solo. I can be self-reflecting. I could be. It's good for me. It was good for me. But then I would develop friendship there, and, and I would have people that I would go back again with, and I would just and I would find the dates and travel. So. And Thai boxing was for me a good way to just, uh, how do you say, like, you know, spare that energy, that burst of energy and put it out. And then I moved to Jiu-Jitsu because it was, I was getting hurt too much. I broke my nose once, I broke my toes, I broke my elbow once, I broke a lot of stuff. So I said to myself, it's, I'm getting older, you know, bone healing is not the easiest process. So I went to Jiu-Jitsu because I always like also contact. And Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is, a, you call it the gentle art, as gentle as it gets, but it's, it's an art of, it's more, I think you can age better with it if you're conditioned. And I started doing it about 10 years ago and progressing in it. And my kids now all do it. And now we're doing a dojo for the family. If it was, it was a good friend of mine that's actually is running and you know, I'm investing in it, uh, uh, a, a jiu-jitsu club here in Dubai. Uh, is, it, is it fair to say that it's the same fadi across all of these? So you're an entrepreneur, but even in your sport, who's very intense about his businesses, that intensity carries into sports. You, you, you're, you get into jiu-jitsu, you're a purple belt, I think you were just in a tournament, you were a vice champion, you said? Uh, yeah, jiu-jitsu is a very organized sport. Yeah. You have belts and you have, so I'm a purple belt and my master, which is the old people like me and you, uh, yeah, I, I, came, I, became, I became second on that. But then, so with then we're, we're, we're financing a dojo with a friend, so the entrepreneurship and the sports have reconnected? Someone teach you something, like this coach of mine that taught me some, a lot of stuff in jiu-jitsu, made me better. Uh, very passionate and he taught me something I wanted also I wanted the benefit of the passion the reward of the teaching but also also to give someone else a, the chance they deserve in life because not you know always given so I thought that you know it combines everything for me so it's not on this specific side it's not for the business if it makes money good for everyone but I think honestly on this one is the passion it's also the person that I'm partnering with that I really like cherish as well in terms of what he brought to me. He brought me a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everybody brings you something different uh, in life. And so I don't think it was the entrepreneurship, but it's starting things together. Yes, like starting things is something I like. I love, I love creating, creation. Creation mm -hmm. is including something. Including dojos. Including dojos. And are you the same at home on a vacation? I mean, when you go on vacation, is it also intensity? Yeah, I can't stand still. <laughs> um, I, I, and that's I'm, my parents, my my family, everybody tells me that I need to just be a bit more calm, be more, uh, you know, just take time for yourself to reflect, uh, you know, meditate. I've never mm. been able to do it. That's not I, true. I, I've, no, I tried, you know, I tried to meditate, breathing, yoga, this is not, I tried, but it's not, it's not me. I'm, I'm, it's not good always because you need sometimes time for yourself. So I force it upon myself every now and then to just do nothing. but. I mean, if I go for two days without sports, I'll, I'll go crazy. If I do two states without doing a few things at the same time. You know, our work, you know, trading and hedge funds and, and equities is a very fast-paced environment. When I left, people told me, why do you go from private equity to public? Because it's much more fast-paced, because market moves faster. I'm a, I'm a fast mover. 
private equity, you stay in a company for seven years, six years, stay on the board, the results could come or could not come, unfold. It's a slower trend. And public markets move very fast. You need to react. So it goes with you in bed when you go to bed at, at, at night. I, I like that adrenaline rush. I'm, I'm a very adrenaline rush. I'm an adrenaline junkie in that sense. So I think it's part, all these sports, even my work, all the adrenaline of a startup failing, losing money. I'm not a gambler. I've never, never gambled, never been a poker player, an avid poker player by any means. But in that sense, I actually, I like adrenaline a lot. I think I live by adrenaline much more, which depletes you when you don't have it, which also after the adrenaline rush, you just whew, exhausted. So actually you, 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 you exhaust yourself pretty well. How does your family keep up with you? I try to get them as busy as I am. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think my kids do a lot of sports. My, my kids do also three, four activities. You know, my, my, my daughters do six, seven hours of jiu-jitsu a week, uh, two hours of gymnastics. I try to give them activities, very important. For me, sports is very important. Uh, I want them yeah. to be healthy. I think healthy is very important for a healthy lifestyle. And how do you carve out time for them? You're doing so many things. Doing these the things, time. like, you know. Is it like, the sport? So, yeah, like, so when, we, when we competed in the World Championship, when the World Pro in Jiu-Jitsu in Abu Dhabi last week, I share the moment, like no one gets interferes in that. Like I'll take each of my daughter, I'll spend the day with her. I'll be her coach on the tatami. I will be, you will see me screaming on TV. Uh, and, and, be, and then the camera of TV just zooms on me because who's this guy in the arena, 5,000 people screaming all the time on his daughter uh, to do this or that. So I think that's the moment where I share. You know, you need to know what to share. I like to teach math to my kids. I've always been a math guy. So math is the discipline where they come to me and sports is the other one where they come to me. For me, giving time is just at least sharing an activity intensely with your kids, because it also shows your intensity, also teaching them. So, you know, Jiu-Jitsu is I go with them for the weigh-in because they have to take their weight, and the second day they fight, so I'll probably go spend four or five days with them just on that. I'll go and watch them every now and then in Dojo, even though it's very hard for me because when they make mistakes, so I try to dissociate that side. But uh, yeah, I, I try to share that side with, with my family. Obviously, you do vacation and so on, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. Each has a different personality. And if I were to ask your wife, what do you think Fadi should stop doing? What would you say? Jiu-Jitsu. <laughs> I get hurt a lot. Because <laughs> I think the body is not, it's, it takes its toll on the, on, on the body. And maybe just relax more, I think spending more time. Okay. Relax. Fadi, your, your journey is far from over. You still have a, a long way to go, but uh, clearly you've also accomplished a lot. If, you know, for anybody viewing this uh, discussion or viewing this podcast, uh, what sort of lessons would you want or advice would you give to somebody who's just starting out today? <laughs> Don't think about the money as the main drive. We live in a very materialistic society, so I'm going to start with that. So I remember when business school, people went to investment banking specifically initially because there was a lot of money in investment banking. And I said, I went to investment banking, I didn't like it, I hated it. I went to consulting. I liked a lot the process of consulting. I actually thought it taught me a lot. And I'm not saying it just because we're having, uh, we're having a, an interview on that, because I think I'm a very, as you see, I'm a very messy person, how I, I, my thoughts are all over the place, but consulting helped me organize my thoughts. And it, it, it basically made me better in pitching to investors and in organizing my thought for a business and convincing people, as opposed to being all over the place, because drive is overwhelming sometimes, enthusiasm is overwhelming, and you can dilute it very fast if you just don't center it. So for me, the advice is first, never be driven by money, be driven by a purpose, like, Success will get you everywhere, everything you want. If you want to be an artist, you succeed as an artist, and then obviously financial success comes as a result of, uh, of everything. So number two, uh, be optimistic and, and don't, be, don't be scared about risk. If you try, you, you, shall, you shall prevail ultimately. You, it's about trying without getting knocked down forever. Like, you know, just, you're gonna get knocked down once, but not get knocked out fully. Like, you're gonna get knocked down. You're gonna get just a, a setback here and there. It's fine, as long as you just believe that you could do it and you learn from that. So not every trade is a winning trade, but learn from the losing trade to have better odds for the next trade. Mm -hmm. Like I told my daughter of her Jiu-Jitsu tournament last week, is like, so she lost in the final to a Brazilian competitor. That was very good, they lost 20 seconds. I'm like, that's so after, you know, two days, I give her to them. Like, that, what did you learn about this tournament, the middle one? Because she, she thought she'd win. She's, she's quite dedicated to the sport. She's like, you know, you never, you never lose. I'm like, no, I'm like, because I always tell them, you know, you, you win or you learn. I'm like, you lose if you didn't learn. Learn, just learn from that loss. What didn't do that and what, what will you do next? You might learn, lose again. You'll just start closing down on the loss opportunities, right? On the loss uh, possibilities. And this, the third thing for me is just have a value system. It's important to share, share, 
If you share, I think you have better odds than people sharing with you. People that don't share their network, don't share their money, don't share their friendships, uh, are not people I like, for example, to, to commingle with. I, I like to share everything with everyone. And I always open my Rolodex, my emotions, my, uh, if I can, my financial ab ability with other people. I think if you share, you shall get also more. I believe in that kind of like, maybe it's not religious, it's karma or it's something. I think if you, the more you share, the more, you ask me, how do you, at, how do you look at opportunity? Is it a relationship? I mean, if you share with people, they'll share with you as well. Mm -hmm. So, and it's, it's, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. It's actually one to many. The more you share, the more you're going to get back, you know, and I think it's pretty important. And don't do it with the expectation that people will give you back. Because actually 99% of people won't give you back. Mm. But as long as you don't change and you give it, I think you, you'll get back. Even though 1% percent will give you back, make it worse for all that those didn't. And I think it's important. So that's, I used to get disappointed. I had this guy, he never showed up, or he had this person. Move on, I think it's, it's fine. That's it. Excellent. And just the last closing thought. I, I don't like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in this like seat here. I didn't build anything extraordinary. I, I just think that I, it's an interesting thing that I, you know, it's a patchwork of a lot of experiences here and there, you know. War kid, you know, France, Lebanon, England, and, you know, consulting, and, and then Saudi. So I lived in Saudi, and kidding you not, like I spent 15 years in Saudi Arabia, one of the countries I lived the most in my, in my life when I think about it. I didn't live 15 years in Lebanon, if you add, add all the years. So you never know where life takes you. Like I would have never thought that I'd be the guy, the guy living in Saudi for 15 years ultimately, right? And now, you know, we built a firm. I'm, I take a lot of pride in Amal Capital with my partners who have done an incredible job building it with me. You know, Ahmad, Samer, Ammar, and, and now also obviously everyone in the team, Riyadh, Samer, all, this, all the team. We built a really nice platform. Like, you know, I'm, I look at the result, I take a lot, it's a decade old, you know, we're one of the biggest asset manager out there, independent, team owned. We don't have any Cedar, we don't have any other. For me, that's, invaluable that what we created, that we created something just because a bunch of positive people just put their head into something and then they just did it. So I don't think it's, it's extraordinary because it's a very boring, in the West it's nothing. But for, for us, we, we take pride in the journey. I, I'm happy with the journey. I'm not happy with it. The, the outcome is great, but the journey is what really matters. I think I, there's a common trait that I keep hearing al alumni saying and they're, you know, it's along the same lines. It's not extraordinary. I, so it's a, the logical result of hard work, but Actually, if you take a step back, uh, all of you as a group, you are extraordinary because all of our alumni actually have, a, have very interesting journeys that start in a, in a point where if somebody just looks at it from a statistical or demographic perspective, they say, okay, you know, this is going to be an average person who goes through life, uh, maybe comfortable, but not noticeable. But uh, I, I find the opposite. I find that, that all of you have broken through where the statistical average should have taken you. And that's something that's quite special. Yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe looking at it this way, you're right. If you look at the numbers, in the numbers, in the, in the big scheme of numbers, you're probably right. I think the ultimate thing is self-belief. I think everyone believes in themselves a bit more. I think you probably have a better chance for a out positive outcome. Absolutely. Fadi, this has been a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Today. Thank you very much.